output of this technology, we call this a life score because it's basically a score that you bring to life with this uh, automatic enhancement. It's like a container of a PDF layer that's your original edition. So you get the precise layout, the, the typeset that's been used, uh, like fonts and everything. Everything is just looks the same as your original uh, paper edition. So that's something that musicians really like. But then there's another layer that is uh, MIDI. I have a tendency to get really excited when I find a cool new bit of technology, particularly one that is going to help my music making. And that is what we're talking about here on today's episode. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. And we're talking today with Paul Leverge, who heads the marketing team for Music, which is a score reading app that I have really been digging. I heard about it about a year ago and I played around with it. And they just rolled out a feature that really caught my attention called Live Scores. It uses Maestria. I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's their AI-driven optical music recognition technology. Paul explains this in greater detail, but wow, <laughs> it's really cool. And so we dig into that and much more. Paul set up a special code so you can check out music for free for a period. And that is at music.com slash contrabass conversations. Quick shout also to our sponsors, Dorico, Ear Trumpet Labs, and Modacity. More on them in a bit. But let's dig into this conversation with Paul from Music. Are you in Paris proper? Is that where yep. is that where you're based? Okay. Okay. Absolutely. How are how are things in Paris at this point? I feel obligated to ask that in 2021. Like, are things starting right. to open up a bit or? Yeah, actually, just uh, yesterday, uh, the bars reopened. So we can, uh, after mo more than a year, uh, we can finally go back to, you know, enjoying life. Uh, we went to a, a little studio with the, the entire uh, music team for a jam session uh, to celebrate. And uh, yeah, so life is uh, picking up again. The venues are reopening uh, slowly. So they have like, they still have a lot, lots of restrictions and everything, but it's a very good thing for all the music community out there because like after a year with that, being able to do what they do basically it's uh yeah it's um a new hope i think for for everyone um i think it's going to be a great year <laughs> that's great no it feels it feels very similar out here in california things have started to open up and we're, we're fortunate in that we don't really have much of a winter out here so mm -hmm. um we've had stuff open outside but just like like you bars have reopened which is always a good sign <laughs> for for folks and and uh music's coming back i finally left the city of san francisco for the first time last weekend in 14 mm -hmm. months so it's uh it's great but it, you know one of my many pandemic projects uh like last march was i i've been i've been people have said i've been preparing for a pandemic for years inadvertently you know because i've done a lot of tech related things and all of a sudden i became everybody's go-to in terms of how do we do this online teaching thing and so right. hugh sung and i uh, who've collaborated a few times over the years uh we did we did a couple of podcasts about what he's done and that's how music popped on my radar and it's it's really cool because it sort of feels to me uh i i I've been big into digital sheet music for a while and I've been I think I bought four score the day it came out on the first iPad that big you know the big generate first generation and it it kind of feels like an updated just just the syncing features in there it it, it it's, it's a cool program so I've been having fun and I decided it's always tough when you invest a lot of time and resources in another app so I'm one of those people that has like 10 gigabytes of stuff in four score but so I've been slowly but surely moving over all my daily work has gone into music now and i'm just really liking the experience and so bravo on a on a cool app well thank you thank you very much yes um a few words about Foursquare. i love this app i really dig it um i'm i'm using it personally as well uh also, just to compare it uh, and get new ideas for for features and everything, it's it's really a great app. I would say that music is very different in the in the sense that from the get go we have a collaborative approach, and to me that's the biggest difference between the two. Fullscore is a, a a wonderful product if you're looking for 
a quick way to get your music onto your iPad and get nice tools to work with it. Uh, but it's a it's an individual product. It's a, something that you will use for yourself and only for yourself. Whereas music has been built around this idea of collaboration between different users, different musicians uh, within, a, I don't know, uh, your band, uh, like a rock band or a jazz band, or even uh, within an entire symphony orchestra. Now we are moving as well into uh, music education, so focusing on all the the interactions between teachers and students and how we can uh, move it uh, to a digital space, move it online. Um, it just makes things easier. And yeah, as, you, as, as you've said, last year has been uh, pretty intense on this. <laughs> Suddenly everybody was looking for this kind of solution. And so that helped us uh, a lot. And we're very happy that um, more uh, people are joining the, the music community every day. Well, it's it's like you're you seem in my mind to be the future, and and, and it's just it's so cool because I, I've been I I just went all in on digital music as soon as I realized oh this is incredible to have you know I'm thinking four score terminology have set lists and every event I have and every event I have had in there and I can remember oh what did I do in 2018 I can call that up and see what I played and when but then it's it's a it's a clo it's a closed playground right it's like just me or i can i can email out annotated parts to my students but the question when people are getting into it is oh can you collaborate with students or this or that and that was one of those first features i remember seeing over a year ago that really made me think huh there's this sync sync function and again i'm, I'm a real novice with all of the, the actual terminology and what, what uh, you all use over there but you can mark in each you can annotate other people's scores right can, can you just describe that or i guess any 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 of those sort of collaborative yeah. features? Sure, absolutely. So um, the first thing uh, I, want, I want to say, just to make it clear for the audience, is that b basically in music, you have your own library where you put all your scores. And if uh, your listeners are familiar with um, Foursquare, for instance, but other apps as well, Piascore, other uh, apps like that, they will be very familiar with this. The, the, the one thing that we have in music and that is very unique is, as you said, this these collaborative spaces that we call projects uh, in the app. And it's basically a shared space where you can upload scores and make it available right away to all the members of this uh, shared space. But this also applies to anything that any modification, any edit that you will do on these scores. So if you write down something on the score, other members can see it live. Um, they can then copy paste it. Um, each person has a different layer of annotation. So you can still uh, stay organized, but you, you can say at any point, hey, I'd like to see uh, the bow wings of the first violin if you're playing in an orchestra or uh, what the bass player is, is, is doing if you're in a band or, or anything like this. And you can just have this information available to you right away, um, which makes it a lot easier to uh, prepare in advance of rehearsal and, and when you arrive, you already know what the other um, people in the band have written down on their scores and it make, makes the entire rehearsal process a lot uh, faster. And uh, another uh, way to use projects is that you can also add uh, media files or record yourself as you play uh, a certain, I don't know, there's, a, let's say you're in a rock band and there's a, this guitar riff and you want to demonstrate it for the, for the rest of the band, you can just add at home just with music, you record yourself. The This recording is added to the project and all the other members have access to it immediately, which means that if uh, they also want to say, okay, let's have a virtual jam, like distance jam before we join uh, for the rehearsal, so we can totally do this uh, using the projects and then everybody has an idea of how they can, I don't know, perform uh, a specific uh, piece or improvise a, a line, uh, make a solo or, or something like this. Wow, it's cool. It's cool. I love that uh, the media integration that you have in there too. Like having the YouTube. I mean, it's like all of the students I've worked with. I mean, YouTube is like their second teacher or maybe their first teacher. And so to just have that as an option, and then you're still you can see the music and page through it and use your foot pedal and that sort of thing. It's uh, that's a that's a fantastic and I'm sure uh, heavily used integration. Absolutely, and it's it's something where. Um, we're actually working on a lot. Uh, so for now, uh, we have 
what we see as kind of a basic media center uh, in the app. So you can upload um, audio files, you can upload videos, you can, as you said, take a video directly from YouTube, you have a YouTube search bar in the, uh, in, in the app and you can get any video uh, that you like. Um, but you can also uh, upload MIDI files uh, if you have them and then you have an entire MIDI mixer available to you where you can make your balance at reverb, uh, pan your tracks, transpose a specific track and so you get full control over, over the music. Um, and Maybe I, I'm not sure if you want to talk about it right now or a bit later, but we are we have announced a new feature that will be live on uh, Monday, May 24th. Uh, so depending on how this when this episode goes out, it, it will be live already probably. And this feature is uh, is an artificial intelligence that we call Maestria, and that it's it's a optical music recognition technology that uses uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning uh, tech techniques to analyze any uh, either PDF file or just a picture of a base per score that you have and recreate uh, a digital version of it that is available in, in, in music. So this means that any score that you put in music will get enhanced uh, by this intelligent intelligence. And so you'll get a MIDI file that corresponds to a notation. You'll be able to listen to it, to control it, uh, transpose it down, up or down, speed it up, slow it down, do anything you like uh, with it. And the, the best thing about it is that uh, this new score format that we call live score will also be compatible not only with music, but with any notation software or DO that you use. It's a universal format. You can use it anywhere. This episode is brought to you by Dorico. And one of the things that struck me about Dorico when I first opened it up was this innovative user interface design. There are five different modes. There is setup, write, engrave, play, and print mode. And here is senior product manager, Daniel Sprebury, and why they set it up like this. As they are presented to you on the screen, they're kind of there in a strip at the top left-hand corner of the screen, and they're very prominent. You can whack them with your mouse, or if you're using a surface, you can tap them with your finger. And that basically then changes the whole UI of the program. It is such an innovative design. It makes working for me so much cleaner in music notation software. I have become such a fan. I use this piece of software every single day. Check them out at dorico.com that'll take you to their page on steinberg's website and there's a free version dorico se that'll let you do practically everything the program does with up to two parts so that's perfect if you're working with a student or making exercises or that kind of thing thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast dorico one of my favorite features about the Modacity interface is the record button right up front and center. And I've been recording myself so much more with that feature. Here's Mark Gelfa from Modacity on why it's so important to record yourself. Well, it's important to have recording that's built for practicers that streamlines the flow. And that means that you can record yourself, listen back very quickly, save if you need to. Recording is an essential part of the feedback loop. And for a lot of folks, they're only getting feedback once a week or once every couple of weeks from their teachers. You can get feedback from yourself every 30 seconds as you're practicing if you record yourself and listen. So the way that that compounds in your practice is multi-fold because you're going to have more awareness of what you really need to work on and you're also going to diminish your stage fright get over the fear of what you actually sound like and actually know what you sound like so once you can embrace your sound with reality and be able to self-direct your practice a little bit more you are on a really elevated path to practice that's why self-recording is so important jason you can learn more about my favorite practice app and get a special deal on lifetime membership by visiting modacity.co slash CBC. And thank you, Modacity, for sponsoring the podcast. I was watching a demo of this on, on YouTube. The, the, the name is blanking uh, for me, Music First or some other, another company. Right. Yeah. So, and I'm thinking, I'm like, mind officially blown. Like, this is the future. This is what I have wanted for forever to actually, like, take that physical. I mean, the demo is just magical. I can't, I, the applications are just mind, mind blowing when you really think about it. And I think it, it's uh, music XML or music XML mm -hmm. or whatever that format is, right? Is that what the, the format is? It's, uh, it's actually a little bit more complex than that. So, what, uh, so the output of this technology, we call this a live score because it's it's basically a score that you bring to life with this uh, automatic enhancement. It's like a container of a PDF layer that your 
original edition, so you get the precise layout, the, the typeset that's been used, the, uh, like fonts and everything. Everything is just looks the same as your original uh, paper edition. So that's something that musicians really like. But then there's another layer that is uh, MIDI. So that gives you all this uh, audio rendering and everything. And then there's another layer on top of this, uh, which is Music XML. And Music XML is basically um, a score format that uh, has been thought as the equivalent of MIDI basically for music notation. So it's a universal exchange uh, format that you can, uh, so you can export from, I don't know, uh, MuseScore or Sibelius and get it into Finale or Dorico or vice versa. So you can basically use it to go across different software um, and yeah, just use the same uh, input. Uh, everywhere in all the products that you use. So basically with this, with uh, Maestria, this new uh, OMR technology, it will bridge the gap, I would say, between paper and digital. Uh, because anything that you own in paper, you will be able to rework it in Sibelius to make a new arrangement or transpose a line or adapt it to a different instrument. Uh, say you're a saxophone player and you have an alto sax, you want to adapt the sheet music that you already have for tenor uh, saxophone. You can do it uh, right away just by really like taking a picture of your score with music, transforming it um, through Maestria into your live score and then getting this live score into Sibelius. Yeah, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be spending a lot of time. I'm gonna have a lot of fun <laughs> as soon as that rolls out. Is that that is that a feature that then's just gonna be baked into Newsec? So like the app I have on my iPad here, that's gonna be in there. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So at first uh, on May 24th, it won't be uh, at this point in the iOS app. It will be only on uh, Music Web, uh, which is the like the desktop equivalent uh, of the app. Uh, it's a, a companion software that we we see as the best way to organize your library, get new music into there. That's just more practical to do on your computer. Um, but yeah, uh, if you have the app, you can just log into your music account the same way you do with the app uh, into Music Web, and then you will be able to use this feature uh, there. We plan on integrating it uh, to the iOS app later this summer. Uh, but yeah, so basically uh, in a few months, anywhere uh, in the music ecosystem, you'll be able to, to use that. Okay, cool. I can't wait. That's that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I, there, you know, I I do a little bit of conducting here and there. Just like uh, I used to do more of that, and I conducted for the first time off of my iPad uh, maybe a year ago, and it was an interesting experience. Actually, um, I had all it was a middle school orchestra, so you know, like 13, 14, 15 year old kids, and so I had my scores in there, but I also had their parts because I wanted to be able to like look at the first violin or second right. violin part and say, hey, second line, second bar, you know, that can be useful with with kids that age. And I had it all sort of uh, scissors and tape to figure it out in four score. But uh, you've got this project feature in Newsec, which seems like a cool way to organize. Like if I was using Newsec for that, I would have had the score in there, but I would have had all the parts in there and I can just kind of flip between them, right? Is that, is, that what, is that what one uses for a project or like what else might you use a project for? Um, so you're right. This is the this is actually the the main use case that we had in mind when we designed this feature, um, because we work with lots lots and lots of uh, like big orchestras, big music ensembles, uh, opera houses, professional choirs, um, and in 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 this context, you have many many musicians uh, joining together uh, and working basically on a collaborative uh, piece of art. I would say. So in order to do this, they, they need to make sure that the other ones have the same information and that, you know, they can communicate efficiently. So, so yes, uh, the way it works in music is that a piece is not just your score. It's uh, meant to be a container for all the different parts, all the different versions of the score that you may have. So if we're taking an orchestra project, uh, for instance, that means that you will have, I don't know, the first violin part, but also second violin, the bass, flute, uh, bassoon, all the parts of the uh, orchestra, and you are able to switch between uh, different parts at any uh, at any given time. So if you're a conductor, you have your full score, um, and you if if you hear something wrong in the violins, you can just like in two clicks go to the violin part, see if there's a mistake on the on the music notation somewhere, or if just like make sure that the information everyone has is correct. Um, but it's not the only use case, um, as you've said, it's also very useful, for instance, if you're uh, a music teacher and you, you work uh, with your students, because you could have 
um, different versions of the same exercise uh, or uh, like simplified versions of uh, a given piece um, and you can have just one piece uh, in your music library uh, with all of these different versions uh, in it and you can give that to your students and say okay for you let's take the basic level it's just like the melody without all the uh, the embellishments and, and everything um, and as your student progresses they can move on to a harder version uh, of the exercise so yeah this is this is one way uh, you could use projects but we have users um, for example in technical departments of opera houses uh, using this to have like the rehearsal program or the list of the staff and you can add anything you like uh, in a project and it's a very flexible uh, thing that you can use um, the, the the main idea is just that everything that you put into a project is available to everyone so whatever uh, that means for your specific use um, it's just a possibility that uh, this tool uh, gives you people have been saying such great things about my course with discover double bass beginners classical bass here is nicholas walker professor of double bass at ithaca college and past president of the international society of basses nicholas writes jason draws from this vast network with his contagious enthusiasm and love of learning presented through the beautifully organized and easily accessible framework of discover double bass this is a terrific learning experience for any beginner as well as a great model for any new teacher i am blushing nicholas thank you so much I'm just so thrilled with how this course came out. Jeff Chalmers and the whole team at Discover Double Bass are so professional. It was such a great experience, and it was the best representation of what I would love to take every single beginner through in terms of format and presentation, and I'm just, I'm just so happy that it's out there. You can learn more. We've got a link in the show notes, or you can just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath. This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. They make hand-built mics out of Portland, Oregon, and they have an excellent mic for upright bass called Nadine. The Nadine is a condenser mic with a clear, natural sound and incredible feedback rejection. This mic is a completely new design. The head mounts in between the strings above the tailpiece with a rubber grommet, and the body securely straps to the tailpiece with Velcro elastic. A 14-inch Megami cable connects the two parts, making it easy to place on any bass. It's durable and holds up to the demanding needs of the instrument while offering excellent sound quality. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt just for Contrabass Conversations listeners with the purchase of a mic. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash Contrabass to claim yours and check out the Nadine. It's an elegant way to do it. And it, it, I have so many use cases that I see myself use, you know, uh, applying this to, you know, when I do music festivals, I like to scan in the schedule and the, mm -hmm. the names of everybody and all those sort of details, the program. And then I love over time, it's great to have these things archived. So the next time that event comes around, you can look and see it, all that sort of info. I'm fascinated. So over here in the United States, this is being, uh, I'm seeing more and more use of digital scores, but I still feel like we're on the early side. Like when I go to see a string quartet, Oftentimes I'll see all iPads out there mm -hmm. or I um, I've noticed even just in like the last four years, I was like the only guy with an iPad at, at playing something. And all of a sudden I noticed and a uh, couple summers ago, all of a sudden everybody seemed to have an iPad um, is it, but but especially in ensembles here in the States, I think we're kind we're on the early side like one of my colleagues in the houston grand opera he switched to using an ipad for everything and he swears by it because he doesn't have to worry about a stand light in the pit and he switches you know but but how widely adopted is uh digital score reading in europe is that do you do you have a sense that you're further along than us here kind of in general um i i wouldn't say that i think we're basically at the same uh, point and i agree with you this is just the beginning but digital sheet music has been around for about 10 years now um one th one thing that I witnessed uh, during my years at, at music and since we started this project is how much um, how much of an impact the, it had that the music publishers are now moving into uh, digital sheet music because um, for some time we were developing a tool that was okay a great tool but there was this this question you know like it's okay digital sheet music digital schools um, sounds super fun super interesting super useful but how do you get it 
where can I buy digital sheet music? And for some time, there was just no answer to this question. You basically had to uh, write down your own music in Sibelius and export it, and then you could use it or uh, find a, a post scan on, on IMSLP and other websites like this to, to, to use these tools. But now that um, the professional music uh, publishing industry uh, is moving into this space, uh, a lot more orchestras and, and ensembles start using uh, digital scores because they can have all the benefits of working with digital scores just like the fact that you don't have to carry around uh, sheet music but also the fact that you can use a foot pedal to turn pages and you don't have to stop playing your instrument just to do this which is a bit crazy when you think about it and all and, and, and there are like lots and lots of benefits so they can now get this and at the same time work with professional editions uh, or text editions maybe that so all the um, they have they can they have you know this familiarity with um with music publishers they know how they write music and and over the years you develop uh, this very intimate feeling of, of with with certain editions so it's important that um that you keep access to to this and what we do at music is that we're not music publishers ourselves we don't sell any sheet music um in music but we work with all the major uh, players in the publishing industry and we developed uh, some specific tools for them to to basically create uh, digital distribution channels um that would help them secure all their material make sure that you can't export um music out of music and just like put it online for everyone to get it uh, so that's not possible you can have multi licenses uh, contracts so that's very useful for orchestras where they say okay we need this piece but we need 80 licenses um and it works just like with i don't know your netflix account for instance if you try to display the piece on a uh like um on another uh screen and you don't have uh, enough licenses you will just be blocked and but you can get an additional license and everything. So it, it makes the entire process more secure for them. And I think this is the reason why they trust us and they partner with us um, in this distribution. This was very needed, I think, for, for the entire uh, music community. It's been so needed. And so it's so it's a bravo on on ushering the publishers into the 21st century, because that's been the I mean, I can't tell you how many rentals I would do for youth orchestras I would conduct and I get the pictures and exhibition box sent to me with all these parts and I couldn't trust my kid, you know, and then erasing the parts or the students lose the parts, you know, the parts for maybe 30, 40 years ago, yellowed, cop, you know, there are just so many advantages. But yeah, and 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 to have that available and have that that protection for the public Publishers, but also in that same app, be able to use your own materials like you can. I mean, the flexibility of what you've built is is outstanding. How I got I got it. So how did this idea happen? This seems like one of those apps I would have dreamed about if I think about when I had my iPad back in 2011 or whatever that first iPad. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like what I hoped would happen. Um, so it's super exciting to see it happen. Like when, when did the idea for music happen? How did, it seems like you've got quite a team working on this. And I just love, you got the emails coming out. I love opening up, hey, here's from Paul at Newsic about features you're educating people. Um, so yeah, just tell me the story of how this came to be. Um, sure. So um, music started in 2014, actually. So it's been wow. some time uh, now. Um, and as you said, uh, it's it was originally originally an idea that uh, that we had um, preparing a concert. So it, there was it, there was um, I wasn't part of this project personally, but uh, the, our our CEO uh, Aurelia, um, she was making a, a concert with, um, with 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 some friends and and. It was a big event and they needed to prepare lots of songs uh, in advance and learn how to play them on a the guitar like for a, basically like a um, campfire uh, concert um and so, so so that's the story basically they needed to like a practical way to work together and they couldn't be together at the same time uh, and I just they had very little time to rehearse and they needed to perform like four hours of, con of concerts and so um so this is so it was a mess it, it was a huge mess uh, because they were all working on paper and they were like there has to be a better solution and they couldn't find any actually so since we're all musicians and, and we uh, just thinking about this problem we realized 
how much potential it has uh, it had you know because this was just like a, a, a small concert uh, with no real with nothing at stake uh, basically but then when you transpose this and and, and you think of, of all the bands all the, the the ensembles that are constantly having this issue and there's just no practical way to um you know to exchange um cheap music or annotations or anything um behind it this is basically how uh, it started so um and it took us um uh, like about two years of initial development before we released uh, the music app on the on the on the app store that was on in 2016 and then it took us um, about yeah about a year uh, to convince the first symphony orchestra to perform an entire concert uh, with it and trust it and trust the system this was um, the big challenge for us uh, at first when this first concert happened this was with the opera de rouen so it's uh, an opera house in um, north west of france um in 2017 um and it basically unlocked everything for all the other uh, players because you know they 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 were very interested but they didn't want to you know take the risk and be the first ones and everything once that happened and we're very thankful for to the the, the amazing team at, uh, team at the opera de Rouen for uh, their trust on, on this uh, once that happened it everything just like accelerated a lot um, and ju just a couple of months later we started uh, implementing the solution at the Vienna State Opera so one of the most uh, prestigious operas uh, in the world and and then we had you know, like today we work with, uh, I'd say like about 50 uh, orchestras worldwide, orchestras, opera houses, uh, like big players. Um, I, my job for a long time at music was to actually travel the world with iPads and my suitcase and go and train the staff uh, in this in this um, orchestras on how to use the, the software. So, you know, speak of a, of a dream job, <laughs> just, okay, uh, next week you're going to New York and training the Mets. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Um, so, so yeah, this is how uh, this all started. And now we're uh, a team of uh, about 15 people. Um, in um, so across different departments, uh, we have, uh, I don't want to say uh, like something wrong. I think we have five full yeah five full-time uh developers uh working on the on the project um and we're expanding because we have the aos app which is our flagship product uh, still today and now there's the web version which is very uh, useful just to make the technology more accessible because not everyone can buy a uh, one thousand uh, dollar tablet just to use uh, um, digital sheet music. So having this available just as a web uh, a web app that you can access from any device uh, was was very um, needed. Um, and then we have all our activity with music publishers. We are now moving into education and 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 the, like implementing the solution uh, at a school at you know school level uh for all the teachers and the students so yeah lots of things uh going on at music well bravo on that kind of growth that's great that you have those, that that the a team that size i mean that just shows that what you're doing is is connecting um it is uh and that educational that's another question people ask all the time for like how can i collaborate with my students and then if you start talking to teachers you know i do a, i in normal time non-pandemic times i do a lot of uh, uh sessions at at various convention music education conventions and i love talking technology but then the question is always how do i implement with this with my students right you know on a, on a school level and that music first uh demo i saw had this really elegant solution can you can you maybe talk about what you're maybe you can talk about Absolutely. whatever you want but just what you're doing in terms of the educational front uh working with schools and such Sure. Um, so, um, okay. So here's the here's the the, the full story. Uh, we launched uh, this new offer that we call Music Education back in uh, back like last December, uh, December 2020, um, and we've been working on on we had been working on this for uh, about a year. Uh, so when the pandemic started, we saw this need and we said, okay, we need to step in and make this technology available to all the teachers out there. Um, so we packaged everything into uh, an offer that we call music education it gives you access to all the products in the music ecosystem so the app uh, music web and and different um, uh, specific features that we're developing for schools where they need you know to be able to restrict uh, some features for kids just make sure that they're in a safe space that no one is going to 
uh, as you said, just erase the work that the other ones have, uh, have done before or, you know, upload something uh, that is not related to what you do uh, in a music class or anything. So just like this, this kind of specific features that like for, for, um, for music schools. And so we pack uh, everything in an offer that we call a music education. You can get it as an individual. Um, it's cheaper than the normal version. It's only for music teachers and music students. But uh, and, and to us, it's very important um, to get this technology uh, and make it available to the new generation of musicians, uh, basically. And then there's also the school offer. Um, which uh, is available starting at 50 licenses and that gives you access to these extra features uh, for schools as well as um, training services by our team where we go and train your staff on how to do this just to make sure that the, impl the implementation uh, goes fine and uh, the last uh, thing I, I, I need to mention is about music first so what we do is we um, we basically like um, this this music education platform into the into music first classroom which is their uh, lms offer so it's just an additional uh, block that you can uh, buy uh, as part of your uh, music first classroom subscription and which gives you access to music education but what's in interesting here is that you can have information or documents or files flow between different software uh, inside the music first uh, classroom environment. So going back to uh, Maestria and you know this new technology, this means that um, a, lo a lot of uh, music first customers use um, uh, other softwares, uh, other software that um, y you know, like uh, like practice first, for for example, where uh, you can have your students perform an exercise, and this will listen to uh, their instrument through their computer microphone and automatically grade them and tell them, okay, this note was off or something. It's it's a very nice product. The problem is uh, it relies on music XML formats, so you need to write down your own exercises to use them uh, in practice first. Now with music education, the interest is that any, uh, you know, like teaching method, any book of exercises that you have um, just like at home or, or or in your music school, you can now convert it and make it available, make it usable in, in practice first by going through music. So, so yeah, um, and, and for us, it's very interesting because um, Music First is basically the largest uh, LMS for music education, especially in the in the states. Uh, so by partnering uh, with them, it means that we are able to reach out to more schools uh, quicker than we could uh, if we did it ourselves. And it's always nice to to work with people who have a real expertise on of what um, music teachers really need and and use on a daily uh, basis. So that informs also our development uh, calendar and how we build our uh, our new features just to make sure that they are really useful for teachers and students. That's exciting. That's great. I mean, that, that's, well, that was one of the big hangups with back, I used to be a classroom teacher back seven, eight, nine years ago. And, and you know, smart music is something that's always been popular, particularly in the band world where most mm -hmm. of the rep is entered. For the string world, that wasn't the case so much. So unless you really wanted to take some time and enter all, all this into finale, you know, make it work, it was just kind of a headache. And so you just have that, that barrier uh, uh, diminished or even removed like, like that. Mm -hmm. It's, that's cool. What a cool, what a cool feature. I was digging this app before I knew about the about the this whole whole new offering. It's it's really I, I can't wait to see what you do a year from now or five years from now or the the, the growth is is pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean for us too, we have you know we always love like our wish list of new features to add to music is like endless. We have so many ideas and things that we wanna we, we wanna do just to make the product even better and even more useful. But it's it's always about you know setting priorities. So at the moment we're really focused on music education. I think this is where uh, this kind of product is most needed. Uh, um, at the moment, even if schools are reopening, uh, there will still be some distance learning and like online uh, music education. So being able to, again, it's, it's about bridging gaps, you know, um, between the experience that you have in the classroom uh, with your teacher and when you're alone at home practicing until the next class. We think that there are ways uh, teachers and students can collaborate in this in-between space uh, that are very interesting. So at the moment, this is what we're developing. Um, but also, we want to make sure that we uh, just like give this technology uh, to 
even more uh, musicians and 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 across different music genres. So even though we started with classical music, um, historically, now um, now we work actually more in other uh, genres: jazz, pop music, rock, um, and. Classical music is still is still big, a big focus uh, of ours, of course, but now we are also considering other types of uh, use cases. And for example, a big challenge for us is about um, the, the making mu making music a real media center where you can get all your recordings. Not really like a doll, but like a mini doll, basically, where all this daily work that you need to do quickly, you can do it here. It's about like getting new tools and making them um, <clears throat> available in a single environment. And this is really the, diff the, the difference, you know, like musicians usually have I don't know, 25, 30 different apps uh, on their phone for their music musical needs you know they will have their tuner they will have a metronome they will have and it's a different product every time and it's 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 quite hard to use what we do in music is we basically redevelop all these features and package them in a single environment so all the tools you need are available to you at any point just like touch this button and it's here um so this means that in the future we will keep on adding new um new features like this um and also working on cross-device uh, use cases like with your computer and your iPhone or your iPad. But you know, again, like uh, as I said before, like not only not everyone can um, get a, an iPad Pro just because that's an, an expensive design, device. But iPhones are very common uh, these days. And when it comes to like scanning a paper score and you know, like to transform it. This is probably the like your your iPhone's camera is probably the best scanner that you can get. It's like an amazing camera that captures like every little detail. So it's actually perfect just to scan a score uh, with this, and you have a dedicated scanner feature uh, in music. So everything is like we just like optimize the score, like the edges and everything automatically recognize this. Um, so yeah, this is just the kind of things that we do. We are just like committed on making your your life easier as a musician uh, every day. Yeah, it's crazy the phone technology. How how good that camera has gotten. I mean, that that's what I would do. You know, I'd buy even like educational music back when I was an orchestra director. The first thing I would do, I believe, I was using Scannable at the time, this Evernote <laughs> app, uh, and I would just scan all the string parts, immediately turn them into PDFs, hand those out, and I mean, just get them digital as quickly as possible. Put them up on Google Drive so we can do, uh, add assignments. And yeah, you know, the usefulness of having the iPad Pro and the Apple Pencil. I mean, that that was a real game changer. Is great, but yeah you're you're a thousand dollars plus in when you're getting into those devices yeah. so having something that you can use on any device if you can access via a web browser is that's tremendous um i'm sure are there plan like the, the question everybody gets when you're developing something on ios is what about android and i know that's always like a much thornier thing than people realize i, I there's a, a smaller yeah. developer here in the in the states uh an app called modacity that I, I know the founder and you know it's like we've talked you know about it's like way more complicated than people think when you start to talk yeah. about that but i'm sure that's on the list at some point um but like like is that is, is that is do you have any any thoughts on that or or yeah. actually, maybe another um, question is we if you are using something on like a i guess you probably couldn't use some sort of stylus on the web version can can you i guess i'm asking a bunch of questions sorry <laughs> yeah no it's uh no it's it's very interesting and all of this is, is very linked um i'll start by answering your first First question, and that will clarify for for the second one. Um, there is no Android version plan anywhere in like short or medium term. Uh, we have we have had this idea, of course, for for some years, and and, and many people ask us about this. But um, as you said, it's very it's very complicated. Uh, it's you know it's technical so stuff. But just to summarize, we have to make a decision between optimizing the performance of our iOS app, which means using the native language and that restricts any further development that we do uh, on this code base to only iOS. Uh, and this is a choice that uh, that we made just because, you know, like for most products, it's okay if you have a bug from time to time and something like this. When you're working with like world-renowned soloists, 
it's just not possible that the app crashes on stage like that would be a disaster so so this is not an option for us and we're really attentive to making sure that the code base is clean the performances are super efficient and and we are constantly optimizing this but at the same time this means that we can't just easily transcribe this code base into another language that and and make it available on on android so our vision for this is that Anyway, musicians love Apple, most of them, um, and they have a tendency to go for Apple devices rather than other uh, manufacturers. Um, so we keep developing uh, the iOS app as our flagship product, but at the same time, we're moving not on Android, but uh, into like just the web. So any Android device can access the web. So any Android device can use music web. And this is how we see things, just by optimizing and making this web version better um, and adding more features into it. We're basically building a mini music mm -hmm. that is available for everyone. So if you're on Android, it's cool. But if you're, uh, I don't know, in China, for instance, where they can't use Android anymore and they have, you know, and, and you know, like, and there are other operating systems, the, the point is that it's basically available on any device that can browse the internet. So it makes it even better than just having an Android version. It's not meant for professional use on stage, uh, to be very clear. Uh, it's more about something that you will use at home or for your, your uh, with your teacher or, or, or other use cases, but not at a professional level. Um, and for professionals, there, there's the iOS app. And if you're a professional uh, musician, you should really get an iPad Pro. Like, not speaking, I'm not just talking about music, like the iPad Pro is such a nice device for musicians. There are just like so many things you can do. And like I do electronic music myself. I have tons of synths that are crazy good. Like you could, and it's like a $20 app where the hardware version of that synth would be like a couple thousand dollars. So, so yeah. Uh, Yep. If you're a professional musician, just get an iPad and and get music with it. <laughs> well, we could do a whole other episode on that, Paul. I'm I'm really into uh, electronic music too. I used to teach an Ableton Live course, mm -hmm. and and so I'm really into that. And I've got my Ableton Push right next to me here. Right. But a few years ago, I got really into making music specifically on the iPad and restricting myself to the iPad. And and the the, the, the where we've come in terms of that is just incredible. I uh, I'm a big fan of Audio Bus and chaining everything together. And like, you know, I'll use my iPad when I'm out and about in way I'm not going to drag my push and mm. I need power and all these things. And so, yeah, the, the, yeah, I, uh, pe people always ask the Android question. So I think it's good to, so I, just so I don't get the, get the emails about it <laughs> that, but, but it's, it's, you know, if you develop for the web like that, then you solve the problem of what about Chromebooks? What about, like you're saying, uh, China exactly. where these aren't so, so yeah, it's, yep. uh, it's a, it's a good way to uh, solve it. And yet I, uh, the iPad Pro, it's a chunk of change, but it is a it opens up so many doors. And just for me, I'm the sort of person that just loses everything immediately. And so it's been it's been great if you really buy into a platform like music and just just put your stuff in there. You know, the more you put in there for me, at least the more powerful this becomes. I have all of my music I play and teach with me at all times, you know, accessible, organized, my markings I can turn on. I mean, just, just it, it, it turns your music into more of a three-dimensional experience and even more so with these new features that you're describing and these collaborative features. So just, uh, again, uh, thanks for doing what you're doing. It's really cool. <laughs> and it's, it's exciting to, uh, to follow along with, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. You know, I'm I'm the same. I keep forgetting everything, um, and I think uh, like lots of teachers will relate to to this. Like when you have a class and your student shows up and they follow and there, there's it music and you're like, okay, so there's no underlying material. Um, with music, it's it's it because as soon it's it's not only about getting your music onto your iPad. It it's about getting. A digital version of it and your live your music library at any point is backed up on the music cloud uh which is completely free for our users so there's like no storage space limit or or, or, or anything any music that you put there uh, there's a copy in the cloud which means that if you forget your ipad if you break your ipad if your ipad got stolen or or anything like this 
all you need to do is connect to your NZK account from a different device and that's it. Or just like from any computer that you have available and you can print the music. You know, it's not only about digital, it's just making sure that you have a copy of your entire library and that you won't lose any precious uh, material that that, yeah, that you have. So even if you're not a fan of performing on digital sheet music, you should get music just to, you know, like make your music safe, basically. Mm -hmm. And this is, and we could do another episode about this. I'll, I'll be brief, but as, as something I noticed as a teacher, uh, and this is something older teachers would complain about, but as soon as we got into the PDF era more, more, and, and we started printing everything there was, and this is a big generalization, but I do think that for students, there was a little bit of a devaluation of the printed copy. And I can't tell you how many times I would print out music for all my students and I'd see half of it lying on the floor after rehearsal. Yeah. And that's something that like mm -hmm. I grew up uh, you know, in the, you know, I was going to school in the late eighties, early nineties. You would never do that. You keep your copy. So but I actually think things have gotten a bit better with the students I've worked with that have gone digital because they're working on that same copy. And so not only you don't want to lose the music, but you don't want to lose the work you've done on and your fingerings, your bowings. And, and it would be so frustrating to have the students, you know, lose the music every time. I'd have to keep five copies of the concerto they're working on because they would just that's just where where they get. And so I found that uh, students and a surprising number have gone digital or the teachers have encouraged them to. Um, I, I found that that's less of a problem. We we already figured out the double stops issue. So that's on that copy. And, and it's so cool that that is all backed up to the cloud via music. That was always a, a, a concern I had with other solutions for score. Before that, I've used some other apps mm -hmm. just because I'm weird. And I was, I was never exactly sure if it was getting backed up or not or where it was, or do I need to copy it and put it on Dropbox or whatever. And so it's just nice that that uh, question is answered. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is why we build the system this way. Just, we, we don't want you to worry about this kind of stuff. Yeah. Don't worry. It's safe. Uh, if you ever you lose your device, you don't lose your uh, your music. And you know that that goes for individuals uh, as well as for larger uh, ensembles. Um, the work we like some of the work we did at the Vienna State Opera was about digitizing their music library. So you have real treasures in there. You have manuscripts from famous composers and everything like, and, and we just ask them this simple question, like what happens if there's a fire in the music library? Mm -hmm. you, you will lose like hundreds of years of, you know, like musical repertoire of manuscripts of everything. It's like, just put this online on a cloud and then it's safe forever. Uh, you know, there's just no way you're you're going to erase this data or everything. And one thing I need to to, to mention is that, of course, like at our team, us music, we don't have access. At, we we can't access your library. It's it's all encrypted and everything. It's all personal to you, so it's just safe. But none of your work is gonna end up online uh, anywhere. We don't have your files. We don't have anything. It's just uh, yeah, it's everything encrypted in, uh, on a secure cloud. Um, so yeah. <laughs> It's great. Very cool. Another reason to use it. And uh, you know, uh, folks listening, it, pick up the app. It's uh, you can use it for free for a, a limited basis. It's super affordable for the, the, the annual subscription is like 30 bucks or 32 bucks or something. It's just a couple bucks a month. Mm -hmm. uh, we are quite, quite worth it. Um, and and joy, sign up for the newsletter too. regardless of, of whether even if you're not using digital music like this, I think the education you're doing in that is really, uh, really Really helpful. So, uh, bravo to everything you're doing. I really appreciate it, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know what? Uh, let me extend uh, an invitation to all your uh, listeners. Um, what I will do is I will set up a, a special offer so they will be able to go to music.com slash contrabass conversation uh, and they will be able to get a free month of the pro version um, so they can try it for themselves with no limitation. Just use all the features and see if they like it. Cool. I will. I will make sure to mention that and link up to that. And that's great. Paul, thanks again for chatting. And folks, check out Newsic and that deal that Paul set up at music.com slash conversations. 
I'm having a great time with this app. I still am using Fourscore, and and boy, like I mentioned in our conversation, the buy-in, or I think I mentioned in our conversation, I'm getting spacey here as, as the summer <laughs> progresses. Uh, I've spent so many hours, and I have so many gigabytes, and have organized so much in Fourscore that moving over once you're in an ecosystem is a challenge. But what I've done so far is my stuff that I'm working on right now, like my actively active scores, I guess might be what you want to call it. I have moved all that over to music and I'm using all the features in there. And yeah, it's an elegant app. I am excited. I haven't done it yet as of this recording, but it's one of my summer projects. I'm excited to dig into this AI technology and to start uh, getting some music XML files and to start experimenting. I just think that there's so much potential there. And it's just really exciting to see people innovating in the space like this. And I think that music is solving so many problems and the problems that I had been quite pessimistic about, frankly, about having, especially in terms of working with music publishers and getting them to make the leap into the 21st century and digital technologies. Well, wow, Nuzik, good job on that. That is really cool. And yeah, love it. Contrabass Conversations is, well, if you're new, hey, maybe I say, boy, I'm having a weird intro and outro day. I don't, I don't have too many things on my mind, I guess. But uh, welcome. If this is your first time checking out the podcast, I really appreciate it. We've been doing this for so long and I continue to look forward to having these conversations and educating myself on the people's backgrounds and uh, topics that we're talking about or new innovations like music. And I, it's a self improvement project for me for sure. And it's great to have you on board with this. If you haven't subscribed, I guess that goes without saying, or I think Apple podcast is calling it follow now. So follow or subscribe or whatever. We have an app. If you are into apps for podcasts, you can check that out. That is particularly good for searching the podcast because of the quantity of episodes and that we have talked about so many topics. If you're trying to dial in on something and you don't have the patience, which I understand, of going through 800 plus episodes trying to find something about right arm technique or something like that, if you go to the app and you just type bowing technique or something like that, if that's been mentioned in the show notes, uh, which it, it certainly has, that will will come up. We've also over the years done a bunch of highlight episodes on particular topics so you can find those easily in the app and that's sort of like a window into further explorations of those topics. So we've done things on various aspects of technique and if you find one of those episodes you're going to get the highlights but you can always go from there and dig deeper. The app makes it very easy. I don't know why I'm selling the app so hard which is free by the way. <laughs> There's no sale. Um, but uh, the it's a great way to also download and save for off offline listening and it's just a handy way to use the podcast a little bit more like a research tool which I know that so I, hopefully a lot of people just listen to this because it's fun but some people do uh, are trying to do that sort of thing and so that's a, a great way to do it if you want to reach out to me feedback at controversyconversations.com is the best way to do it and I love hearing from folks whether you're just saying hi or you're suggesting a guest or a topic that is all awesome Contrabass Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper Steve Hinchy, Mitch Morgan and Trevor Jones. Mitch makes beautiful award-winning bases just east of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Kilgore, Texas. Look him up at MitchMooring.com. Check out what he's up to. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the Lord of the Spectrum. Mm -hmm.